Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today and happy Juneteenth. I am Sarah Custer, digital editor here at Times Higher Education. Since the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police on May 25th, Black Lives Matter protesters have taken to the streets in almost every state in the United States in outrage at the death of yet another black person at the hands of police. Racism is back on national agendas like never before with public pledges to do better from corporations, state and local government, and yes, universities. The protests have spread beyond the US as well, drawing thousands to the streets in the UK, Australia, and France, and other places, all demanding a change to the system. And universities are responding to those calls with messages of support and promises to tackle racism on campuses. But a phrase I've seen coming up often from black scholars has been, we've been here before. And indeed we have. Just last year, students at Goldsmiths University London protested for 137 days against institutional racism. In 2015, the Roads Must Fall movement began in South Africa to take down the statue of imperialist Cecil Rhodes from the campus, and the protest then spread to the University of Oxford in the UK, where just this week, the university promised to take it down after five years. As we see it, and we saw it after the police shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, and in the UK after the murder of Stephen Lawrence in 1993, and in Tuscaloosa in 1963 at the University of Alabama when the governor stood in front of an auditorium to block two black students from entering. So here we are again talking about institutional racism in US and UK higher education amid pledges to make change from institutions. But will that actually lead to greater equality and how? And what could universities in both countries perhaps learn from each other? So that's what we'll be talking about today, and I am very pleased to have three experts on race and higher education joining us today. First, we have Wayne Frederick, who is a surgeon as well as a professor and president at Howard University in Washington, DC, one of the most prestigious historically black universities in the United States. We also have Funmi Olonisakan, vice president and vice principal international, as well as professor of security, leadership and development at King's College London. Funmi is also an appointed member of the United Nations Advisory Group of Experts conducting review of peacebuilding architecture. And we have Leslie Harris, a professor of history and African American studies at Northwestern University, who has recently co-authored the book, Slavery in the University, Historicies and Histories and Legacies. So thank you everyone for joining me today. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> And thank you everyone to tuning in for us today. Um, we have had over 1000 registrations for this webinar today from 45 countries, which I think is just evidence of how important this topic is to so many people around the world. Um, I will be taking questions from you. So please do use the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll be getting those through my mobile phone. So if you see me looking over here, that's me um, checking the questions just to see if there's any way to weave them into the conversation. Um, but first, I would like to get us started, and I think I'll turn to the historian in our group, Leslie, um, to ask you if, how does it feel right now? Is this, is this a deja vu moment for you in terms of confronting racism in universities, or is this perhaps just part of the long, slow process of dismantling systems of white supremacy in higher education? I would say this is part of the long, slow process. Um, this uh, push to investigate the histories of slavery in universities began in the early 2000s, but of course we had a major set of student uprisings in 2015 um, after a series of uh, racial incidents on campuses across um, the US and, and in response to the fact that on many campuses there were, there were and still are buildings and statues that honor uh, slaveholders or members of the Confederacy. So in my, and of course you could go all the way back uh, to the founding of universities as my colleague Craig Wilder has explored in his book, Ebony and Ivy. So um, this is yet another moment when hopefully we have the opportunity for change and we can continue to think creatively how to create more equitable um, universities, more access to higher education. Hmm. Um, Funwe, I'm wondering if you could come into that. Um, before this change can happen, is, is one of the first steps universities owning their legacy of imperialism and uh, participation in slavery and perhaps even their more modern missteps, is that necessary before actual change can, can really come? Absolutely. I, I think that is an important starting point without acknowledging uh, the historical injustices that we have been associated with uh, as institutions without acknowledging even the recent uh, uh, 
uh, if you like, patterns and histories of injustices. Uh, we cannot begin to convince our communities uh, that we can be trusted uh, to make change happen. And I think that is the single most important issue as, at the structure, at the foundation of any kind of change uh, that we want to make as institutions. Mm, it, it sounds like it, the beginning of this is having those uncomfortable conversations and, and having those difficult conversations. Wayne, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, I think certainly we have to have the uncomfortable conversation, but I have to be honest with you, I think um, most of us are beyond talking uh, at this point. And, and the one thing about the uncomfortable conversations that I don't think um, has been rich enough uh, are the solutions. Mm. Uh, you know, if you go back and you look at the conversation around reparations uh, in different, in both the UK and, and here in the US, um, it takes on a very different type of conversation. Um, now though, when you talk about defunding police, but you talk about investing in social structures, um, all of a sudden we have the same appetite. It's a horse of a different color. Mm. Um, it's a zebra probably without stripes, but it's the same thing. You have to invest in the communities where you've de-invested for so long uh, to ensure you do that. So you can call it whatever you'd like, but I think that's the most uncomfortable conversation uh, that we all have to participate in and be committed to. Mm. Um, <clears throat> taking it back to, to academia just a bit, if we're talking about the legacy that universities in general have had, what about the, the legacy of uh, oppression and the history of oppression within fields themselves? Is this something that should be part of the core curriculum in, in science fields, especially in, in history and in the humanities, the history of, of oppression in student specific fields? Should this be part of the required reading of an undergraduate curriculum? Funmi, I'm seeing you nodding your head. Uh, absolutely. I, I think th th this is vitally important when we've had this conversation uh, uh, in various settings. Uh, I know that those of us in arts and humanities and the social sciences will probably sit uncomfortably and talk about the kinds of changes we can make in program content uh, and pedagogy, but there's still a debate in it. And scientists will say, uh, you know, how can you begin to alter universal subjects? But there is something about what we teach, how we teach it, and who teaches it. Yeah. Uh, and to my mind, even telling the, your students the history of a subject begins to paint a picture of uh, who has dominated that field, who has been writing about it, mm -hmm. and how have they been writing about it, and so on. I think all these things have to be uh, on the table within our universities. That's part of the uncomfortable conversation we need to have, uh, even as academics. Hmm. Hmm. Wayne, I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, from a quite a unique position sitting at the head of a historically black college, would you say that your curriculum looks different to what other universities in the United States would look like? Oh, it, it definitely does. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago and uh, was taught a history about Christopher Columbus as an example. And I came to Howard University and took an Afro, Afro, African American studies course, uh, took a course in art appreciation and African American art and saw a totally different world. I mean, today is June 19th. Um, it happens to be my grandmother's 96th birthday, so I grew up looking at and investigating everything about June 19th and had a different perspective. But being on Howard's campus, I was taught something different. I mean, even as you were just talking about in terms of uh, curriculum and certain fields, um, I think medicine is a classic example. Mm. At the turn of the prior century, you had Abraham Flexner, uh, write a report, went to every North American medical school and basically wrote a report on what should happen and should not happen with those schools. That then resulted in a change in what we did for medical education. The thrust was to make it more rigorous. But what he also did was he, it resulted in eight black medical schools going down to two, Howard and Mehari being the only two left. And since then, we have not gotten above 3% of the applicant pool and the uh, enrollment in medicine, medical education in the US uh, going above that. That's over mm -hmm. a century by one person historically doing something that changed it. He said women don't have an inclination for medicine. And sure enough, what resulted in the next 50 years was that you had less women applying to medical school. So mm -hmm. the historical perspective of these things is important. And I'll end on one note with respect to that. Abraham Flexner became the vice chair of Howard Board of Trustees in the 1930s. 
So my, my licking him up and licking up the legacy he left, it's also complicated. And that's the other thing about history. And, and I say this very carefully with, in the presence of Professor Harris, that why you have to have the uncomfortable conversations because the context is important. Here's a man who did something that probably impacted uh, the number of uh, blacks we have in medicine in the US. And at the same time, he sat on the board, in my opinion, uh, of one of um, the greatest romantic institutions that the United States has ever created here mm -hmm. at Howard University. So it's a complicated history. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I mean, I think that's part of the, the conversation around um, taking down statues, or Leslie, you mentioned buildings, renaming buildings, how to reconcile the history that is potentially also erased whenever those are taken down, or, or how to move that history to make sure that it's not forgotten whenever a statue or a, a statue is taken down or a building is renamed. What do you think about that, Leslie? I want to add, I, I'll get to that in a second, but I also want to uh, appreciate the uh, discussion of the Flexner Report and add a piece about this uh, changing the curriculum and educating ourselves and our students about uh, the curricula that we teach the disciplines. I think it's really important that the faculty and administrators also engage in that education. Um, our students, I find my students are eager and aware, even if they don't know the history, they are aware that they're in non-diverse or less diverse environments and they'd like. It's really the faculty and administrators who I think need a deep dive into an understanding of their disciplines, of the racial basis of their disciplines, the exclusionary practices that were in place. And that's something that I think whole universities can do together. I ran a project at Emory called the Transforming Community Project, where we invited everyone into a conversation about the role of race at the university. And that was very eye-opening, not only for students, actually mostly students didn't participate. It was mostly staff and faculty who were the big participants in that project. So I just wanted to add that. Hmm. In terms of taking down um, statues and names, I think that we are certainly in a very interesting moment, which I could not have predicted uh, even several years ago, a decade ago. Um, some of this began, unfortunately, with the death of um, nine parishioners in uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina at the AME church there. And I am still stunned that it took uh, the death of, of nine people in a church, as was repeatedly said, for the Confederate flag to be taken down um, in that state, which had been a struggle uh, that uh, had been spearheaded by many people um, for decades, uh, to not fly the Confederate flag over um, the state capitol. Um, and we're now in another, uh, and that led to a wave of uh, taking down of Confederate statues. It's what fed into the 2015 student uprisings where students argued that the names of buildings should be changed. I think there are a couple of things to think about um, in terms of removing the names of enslavers and of Confederates and uh, uh, people like that. One is, is um, our history is very complicated. So Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, these were all slaveholders, and yet they bequeathed to us some of the structures of our nation that uh, opened up uh, opportunity for many. And so how do we uh, both acknowledge the good that they did, good people can do bad things, but also hold that they made some very big missteps that led to the foreshortening of lives for millions and the deaths of millions of people if we think about the Civil War, not to mention the lives lost during slavery. So sometimes holding on to those figures, those symbols and those names is an opportunity for us to understand the complexity of humanity, that good and bad can exist in the same person and how do we reconcile and live with that? On the other hand, the continued uh, praising of, of uh, people from the Confederacy, the, those in the states in secession who drove the Civil War, uh, uh, seceded from the nation, who were basically traitors. I, you know, there are very few nations, we may be the only nation in the world that has uh, statues and monuments in our governmental buildings to the people who were intent on destroying the very nation. Um, there's a struggle right now in, in the House of Representatives and in the Senate here in the United States about whether or not Confederate figures should be in those buildings. These are people who did not want the United States to exist and who said that slavery was correct and should continue for the, uh, that African Americans should be enslaved for uh, generations to come. So um, uh, 
I think with, you know, with each institution, we are going to continue to have these debates about how to honor, who to honor, and who to commemorate, with commemoration not meaning a positive thing, but something that we want to reflect on. We want to think about the complicated positions that they held, the good and the bad that they did. One example is Woodrow Wilson at Princeton, for example, inaugurated the UN, also very much uh, in charge of white supremacy. Mm. How do we hold both of those things? Um, mm. How do we take the lesson of that complicated figure forward in our own lives? Funmi or Wayne, I, I, I'd like to give you an opportunity to come in on that. Funmi? I, I, I think I recognize, I agree with Leslie, I recognize the complexity of all of this, but uh, times change. Uh, several hundred years after slavery, um, still less than a century after, you know, colonial rule in, in the way, in, you know, uh, that we experienced it uh, in Africa and Asia ended. We now have citizens of those countries. We have great, great, great grandchildren of those who were enslaved uh, in our classrooms. And so the statues that we keep on our campuses say a lot about who and what we glorify. And, and if we don't begin to do something about the presence of those statues by telling the full story. Mm. And telling the full story means have a plaque on the side. Uh, we, we know this about the duality and even more than the duality that exists, that the things that coexist in the lives of human beings. This was John Doe, who was a slave owner, a slave trader, who later years became a philanthropist and awarded all these scholarships. Let people know, and side by side, are the slave trader and the slave owner, if they have done so much for that institution and have changed over time and have changed the face of things over time, uh, if you like, repented. Let's therefore put statues of those who were victims of this and those who did well amongst the communities uh, that were ostr ostracized or at least uh, really treated as badly as we saw in slave trade and, colonial, and the colonial era. Let's have those statues side by side. Mm. Because it's very difficult to maintain uh, this, the, this sort of postures in the 21st century when our classrooms and our campuses are, are full of people who will look at what we glorify and therefore understand that it says something about them as well as, as people. And that's what we're struggling with at the moment. We need mm. to be able to tell the full story. Hmm. Wayne, from a, from a university's perspective, do you think it's, it's acceptable that different universities are taking different measures on this? Some of them are, are jumping in immediately and changing the names of buildings and saying they're sorry they didn't do it sooner, or some of them seem to kind of be eventually bending to the will of student protesters and kind of begrudgingly taking down a statue? Yeah, so this, this is probably where I'm going to get a little um, <laughs> off the beaten path here. You know, be, being at Howard University is a very, very special opportunity. And I try to tell people that, I mean, my blackness uh, and my black experience has been very different. I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago, had a black prime minister, uh, Sir Eric Williams, uh, who first uh, went to Oxford and then came to Howard. He describes Howard as uh, the black Oxford and came here to refine his political skills as a political science professor and would go back and basically, um, you know, overthrow colonialism and make Trinidad an independent country in 1962 and a republic in 1976. So my experience growing up in that country with black doctors, black, um, you know, judges, my, my, dad, my grandfather was a black lawyer. Uh, I had a very different experience. I, I then come to Howard and I walk in the halls of a hospital with black physicians everywhere. And so the, the thing about being at a historically black college and university like Howard, which by the way, also employs the largest number of African-American faculty um, at any four year institution in this country uh, is extremely unique because you are never questioning that there's no statue or existence mm. or glorification of anyone um, who fits that bill anywhere on my campus. Having said that, um, I was in South Africa in 2015 um, when the first defacement of uh, the Rhodes uh, statue occurred. And, and it was quite an experience being in South Africa as a black man 
um, from a, a country that was once colonialized and then being the head of Howard University in America, it was quite an experience to see students um, speak against that. And it made me think about it. it. It made me think about what was the right thing. And the one thing that I have thought about since then, and I feel very strongly in this moment about, is that we should spend more time raising up the histories of Black people and their contributions to these institutions than anything else we do. So whether or not you're in a camp to remove the, the monuments and so on because of the hood that they propagate or the falsehoods, we should spend just as much time making sure that people understand who are the people that stood side by side with them. There are young people in this country, in the U.S., who don't realize that there were black congressmen um, before Jim Crow. They just do not get that. And that concept doesn't get there. We now look at a Senate that has an African-American woman in Senator Harris and uh, Cory Booker and Tim Scott, uh, three people out of 100, and we think, wow, you know, that's it. But th that's not the totality of our history. And so maybe uh, in the halls of Congress, uh, we should spend time uh, putting up statues about those, you know, congressmen and so on from that era so that we could tell the totality of the history. And I think that that's the, the part that this moment still to me is lacking um, in its veracity and in its conviction uh, that we have to raise up the stories so that the stories are more complete. And I think if you tell that more complete story, you begin to erode the impact of the hood that holding up those other um, uh, statues and those other men uh, of that era. And I say men because they were primarily men who also suppressed women's rights to vote, which we also don't often tie in. It's not just about racism, but it's also about severe sexism. Mm. Uh, and I think if we do that, uh, I think we get a more balanced uh, structure and a more balanced imagery of both of these countries. Yeah, I think you've just hit on a really good point, Wayne, about just how important statues actually are whenever we look at the people who don't have statues, just how important it is to raise up those voices and to celebrate them. But at the same time, I feel like there's a bit of distraction going on here by universities focusing on changing names and taking down statues and perhaps just kind of dusting their hands and saying, look, we've done, we've made progress. Look, we've done that. When the real work is actually doing research into exactly what systemic racism is happening, how it's happening until we can actually, before we can actually make any change on that. For me, that was a point that you had made up in, or that you had brought up in an op-ed that you wrote for THE a couple of weeks ago. And I'm wondering if you could just expand on that point a little bit about how the real work is researching it and actually measuring it before we can actually make some change. Well, no, absolutely. If, if all we're going to do uh, is remove statues from our halls um, or monuments uh, that reflect uh, an unjust past, uh, if that's all we're going to do and then we leave it uh, and say we have taken action, then that's not, that's not enough. And the point I was trying to make is it's an important starting point to have a conversation uh, with your community. It reflects a commitment to turn, uh, to turn the corner uh, to, to a brand new period uh, in which you can begin uh, uh, to not just to right the wrong, but to bring the entire community of scholars, uh, students and staff together to begin to tell a new uh, history of the institution. And part of the ways in which we'll do that, and that will be twofold. Number one, Evidence that there's a re there are researchers. And so, so Leslie, you, you want the Leslies in uh, many of our institutions in the UK. Uh, of course, uh, Howard tells a story uh, that uh, that we haven't seen in the UK in that sense. And why not? Why can't we even have that kind of story? But you want academics who are able to be able to paint that picture uh, in such a systematic way that students understand what went on in the past. You want students that are studying this, uh, this subject uh, as, as a part of the program. But then you want to move on to create an environment in which every staff and student uh, feels a sense of belonging. And that sense of belonging is at the heart of what we do with the curriculum, is at the heart of the institutional culture of, of our universities. And so there's a long way to go, but we need to be able to look at uh, every university from now on, if we're really serious, and see, and see a program and see commitment that reflects that telling the story, that reflects getting students uh, from across all walks of life in their diversity, sitting in the classroom and feeling that that course, that program represents them. 
mm -hmm. uh, and feels that they can participate in it in a way that the outcome for them is not so far removed uh, for a black person uh, than it is uh, for a white person, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a lot of work to be done. I, I think we shouldn't take for granted uh, that uh, what, what we've seen in the last few days in Oxford, for example, we shouldn't take for, for, for granted that we'll return uh, to the same places where we were before this protest happened. But it's up to us as academics, as university leaders to begin to take those steps, uh, not just individually, but collectively as well. Uh, because mm -hmm. the students who we teach uh, very bravely have told us that they need to feel a part uh, of the community. Thanks very much for, much for that. I'm just going to turn to some of the questions that some of the people have been sending in to us. And there was a good one that came up that was, um, how would you encourage academics in their discipline to decolonize it when suggesting people to reform their teaching content and pedagogy often meets with resistance by them? And this is a point that I, I wanted to go back to about decolonizing the curriculum. Um, I think there's a big power struggle here in terms of if we decolonize it, that means bringing in other voices and perhaps taking away some voices. So how do we, how do we balance that? And how would you encourage a reluctant peer, for example, or even a, a colleague to decolonize their curriculum? Leslie, let's go to you. Sure. Um, one of the things, you know, it's, it's, it's work and it's real work and it's work that needs to be both uh, I, you know, classic administrative, uh, administrator speak, carrot and stick. And so when I was at Emory, one of the things we did was we sponsored summer programs. We paid generously into research accounts for people to take a course to rethink how they were teaching uh, and, and what the difference that diversity made. And um, that could be done in a number of ways across universities. Um, in departments, having, uh, creating a growing group of people who are encouraged to retool their pedagogies, who are encouraged to rethink uh, the material that they teach, who are given time and resources to do that. We do this all the time. Um, uh, we just did it when we all had to go online to teach yeah. via Zoom. We mm -hmm. can do the same thing around these issues. But we rarely commit the same kind of strategic planning to these kinds of programs. We tend to, when there's an emergency or an embarrassing uh, racial incident, is when we tend to focus on it. But it really is about sustaining these efforts for the long haul. And it's also sometimes about using the stick with certain recalcitrant departments. And it's often departmental cultures, not individuals, but departmental cultures that support old ways of uh, judging merit, old ways of thinking about diversity. And, um, and that harms not just uh, uh, black people or people of color, that can also harm women. It can harm first generation students, people who do not learn in, um, uh, who, who don't all learn in the same ways. The second is we really do have to think about um, we are still in this country, at least, uh, in um, we have a problem with our K through 12 system. And so what do we do if we want to encourage more students to come to university? How can we support them? When we desegregated in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of summer programs, bridge programs to help students who may have lacked in certain areas of their education, recognizing that uh, we had gone through a period of Jim Crow segregation where K through 12 education was unequal. Well, frankly, K through 12 education is still unequal. Hmm. And so we still need those bridge programs. And, and, and um, that's not the student's fault. That's our society's fault. And we should be making a difference there. One of the incredible things about our HBCU system is that it has figured out how to help a much wider range of students with a much varied group of backgrounds. And we could really learn a lot about the H, about education from the HBCU model. HBCUs still produce, their undergraduates in larger numbers go on to produce uh, medical degrees, PhDs, et cetera, in much larger numbers than students of color in historically white institutions. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that we need to learn about, uh, about what that means. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it means changing our ideas of what merit is in higher education. Hmm. And I'm not sure that we're quite ready to go there, but I think we really need to go there if we want to educate the numbers that we need to educate 
in order for our countries to make a difference. Hmm. Um, talking about the carrot and the stick approach, I'm wondering if, if Wayne and Fumi, what you think, should there be more of a stick ap approach from a national level or even a state level in terms of decolonizing curriculums and, and perhaps mandating universities to come up with real strategic plans to actually tackle the racism that exists in their institutions? Wayne. Well, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a balance. In the U.S., some of the great institutions of higher ed are public institutions funded by states and, and so on. And so there's an opportunity to do that. The role the federal government plays in terms of the Department of Education, uh, there's probably an opportunity there as well. And as, um, you know, uh, Leslie Harris just mentioned, uh, when you look at uh, areas such as uh, K through 12, there certainly is uh, incentive to do that. I think the flip side of that, though, I would say is also you have to look at investment in terms of solution. And I think, um, you know, Funmi was, was alluding to this um, earlier. Uh, the historically black colleges and universities, of which there are now 105, um, represent only 3% of the higher ed institutions, and we enroll about 290,000 students in the U.S. We produce, when you look at African Americans in the STEM disciplines, we produce almost a third of those African Americans. When you look at judges throughout this country, we produce about 80%. When you look at the members of Congress uh, who are black, and the number of them who have attended HBCUs. When you look at the first Supreme Court Justice, Thurgood Marshall, who's a Howard alum. Howard University, as I said earlier, sends more African-Americans to medical school. But when you look throughout all of the fields, the HBCUs are critical. Our collective endowments, the 105 institutions, of which Howard has the largest at 750 million. And I want you to keep that figure in mind. The collective endowment is 4 billion. Mm. The endowment of Harvard as of today, and I'm not sure how the markets are going after the bell rings, but mm -hmm. it probably is on the order of about 30 to $40 billion. Mm. You cannot tell me that if you're going to burden in an outsized fashion 105 institutions to produce and diversify your country's workforce, that you cannot then turn around and ensure that there's appropriate investment. And again, I don't know what you want to call it or, or whatever shape you want it to take. The reality is that we have to make sure we do those things because those things then trickle down to the things like curriculum. It frees people up to do the types of things that they want to do without worrying about the publish and perish type of environment we've created in academia. It allows people to write about the things that are important, to educate people about the things that are important and to research things to educate the rest of us about what's important. So back to that issue of how you impact the curriculum, you need a young faculty member to be brave and bold enough and well supported to say, I'm going to go and look at every, every um, professor or faculty member that came from Ghana that is in a UK institution and look at what their production has been what they have offered uh, to the field. And um, somebody has to write that history, but who is going to fund that in order for us to fundamentally raise up the stature um, of the black academic and the, the contributions of blacks in these fields. And I think that that's such an untold story. Mm. You know, unfortunately, a tragically untold story as well. Mm. Thanks for bringing that up, Wayne. I, I agree that is something that, that definitely needs to be highlighted more. Funmi, I'm, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come into the question that I asked about national mandates in terms of decolonizing curriculums and, and anti-racism strategies. What do you think? I have to say that I think ultimately the kind of transformation that we, we need will come from the bottom, uh, will travel bottom up. But then you need nationally a framework that allows us to assess. It's very difficult in this country for universities to be told uh, what to do by the government when it comes to questions of program content uh, and assessment, uh, for example, the very things that are going to help us transform, uh, you know, the curriculum. But that we're already beginning to see the discomfort I, I, and at three levels. At, at the level of the academic, there's a debate uh, that will forever rage on around, you know, amongst uh, different disciplines, even within disciplines. 
as to whether what decolonization means uh, to start with and whether actually it's not about power. Uh, are we replacing one thing with another? Or are we asking things to sit side by side? So, so ultimately, uh, I think there's no debate anymore about the need for a plurality of ideas uh, and reflecting deep histories in the subjects uh, that we teach, even if there's a resistance to do it. But the real bottom-up uh, demand is from the students who sit in our classrooms. Uh, and I, I realize that the, uh, U the US, Canada, and, and the UK are probably at different trajectories uh, in the way that we're experiencing this conversation at the moment. But if you think of the fact that we would have uh, a couple of hundred thousand international students uh, in UK universities, uh, it, it, without COVID, we would have them present on our campuses. Uh, they're from all over the world. At King's, we have about 10 to 11,000 students from 150 countries. And if we're going to present them every year with a Eurocentric curriculum, mm. we have something else uh, coming. Uh, Wayne was talking about the, the health area. What we've done uh, at King's since 2001 is that we, uh, just like several other universities in, in London, we, we have had the extended medical degree program. We've reached out to our communities uh, to, to young people from homes where their parents never went to universities, underprivileged homes, and we've asked them to come to campus. And they do not look like majority of the students on campus. And that's where you find many of the black students who are now in our medical schools. But then if those students tell you uh, that they want disease mechanisms uh, that reflect uh, the societies that their parents are from, from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nigeria, Ghana, Zambia, and so on. Uh, it's very difficult to resist that. And so uh, at this moment, the last couple of years, we've had to have networks around black attainment gaps. Uh, we have had to, at this moment, we're also trying to talk about cultural competency because for academics to rise to the occasion, we ourselves have to become culturally competent, see the world through the eyes of the students in our classrooms. Mm. You can't even ask me as a social scientist to, that it's okay to teach political science only from the point of view of European history or European uh, engagement with parts of the world to a very diverse classroom. Mm. And I, I think that bottom up pressure is what is going to finally get the government. Uh, and I do not see that we're going to get there if we have piecemeal assessments of institutions and we do not have a national framework uh, that helps us hold ourselves to account. Mm. So, so government and, and, and universities will have to meet each other uh, in the middle, but we need to work together to really agree a framework that works. So far, uh, we have not done anything close to that. Mm. Wayne, going back to the, the point you made about investment, uh, I'm sure some of you have probably seen the news about the CEO of Netflix donating $120 million to historically black colleges and the United Negro College Fund. Um, and this is just one example of how lots of people are coming forward and, and making efforts and donating towards helping black students and supporting black students. Is there another flip side to this as well that is, it's not just about fixing black people or focusing on black people, it's also talking about whiteness in the academy and what being white means in higher education. Yeah, so first, let, let, let me um, be clear. That gift um, from Reed Hastings and his wife uh, is monumental. And I think we all, um, in this dark hour of our history in the world, I uh, should take pause and recognize there's so much goodness around us. Howard University will not see a dime of that money. Let me just be clear. We don't participate in the UNCF and uh, 40 million each will go to Morehouse and Spelman. And I am just as enthusiastic about the fact that he and his wife choose to give that gift uh, to historically black colleges and universities because that's part of what we need, the investment. Uh, and that investment is to allow students to be able to matriculate um, at our institutions because what they get here uh, is an extremely special education. And as I tell students at Howard, you don't come to these institutions to get a degree, you come to get an education. And the reason that, that you come to get an education is because that equips you with tools to go out and change the world around you. That's what an education at Howard means. And for somebody to fund that, what he has just, he and his wife have just funded, in my opinion, is probably the next black president of the United States 
they've probably funded um, a few senators uh, who will change laws and put laws on the books. They've probably funded a few Leslie Harris's uh, mm -hmm. who will be professors of history and tell the stories that we need. So that gift is important. The whiteness that you speak about, I think is also sometimes uh, mis misdirected or miscalculated um, as well. Uh, there are white professors on my campus who are very dedicated to the mission as well. And what they do in terms of their contribution um, is clear. Their, their dedication to this uh, is important. They understand the students. They understand what the students need. And I think they make just as much of an effort as everybody else does to make sure that we do the right thing. And so just as it is, it is not about whitewashing away um, a history, whether or not that history has been taught to us, um, but it is about, I think, telling a more balanced story. And I think with investment, whether that investment, regardless of where that investment comes from, what it must do is to uphold the ideals of our institutions, not allow us, to, not put us in a situation where we compromise our ideals or we get off trying to do something else and become somebody else that we're not. And more importantly, that it funds uh, the very research and students. So yes, this gift is towards students. I want to see gifts uh, that promote faculty um, research. Our faculty tend to uh, be underpaid, as an example. And all of those things are things that uh, we have to stand up and we have to support. So I, am, I, I can't express um, my enthusiasm and gratitude uh, for that gift. That announcement was made on June 17th, and that happened to be my birthday. And I told uh, the entire social media world that could not have been a better present. And people were asking me, how much money is coming to Howard? And I said, not a dime. But <laughs> those students will come to my med school, my grad, my grad school, my law school, and they're, bigger, they're part of a bigger ecosystem for which we have to be very, very excited and happy about those types of contributions. Hmm. Leslie, if I could go to you on this topic as well, is, is there a risk that um, the solution that universities come up with is focused too much on, on black students and black scholars and not enough on whiteness and, and what it means for white academics as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think, you know, we have to uh, think beyond the problem being the, uh, the problem being situated in one group of people. Mm. I agree, though, completely with President Frederick that my experience and my experience as a professor has been in predominantly white institutions. It's more that people want to do the right thing overall, but really don't know how. Um, and in the uh, the rush to do, you know, uh, the publish and perish, the research, the just uh, every day of university, it's very easy for institutions, again, not to give faculty, staff, students, administrators enough time to really um, deal with these issues. Um, mm -hmm. Institutions want to set up one vice provost for diversity or, you know, the chief diversity officer without building the kind of infrastructure and the ongoing learning opportunities that we all need to address this problem in a creative way. I think a lot of institutions are really afraid. Um, it's a, it, they see this as a risk, but uh, if we begin to talk openly and honestly about our histories, in my experience, if we talk about that openly and honestly, and if we give people the space to think creatively about how to make these changes, we do this all the time. That's what universities are for. We have people on every campus, I would say, around the world who study these issues, who think about how to make change around diversity. Are we really taking seriously their research and their experience and using it in our own places of higher education? Mm. We have an amazing opportunity right now. And um, we should really be the beacons of how to create institutional infrastructural change around these issues. But often we're thinking in terms of legalistic um, terms. Uh, we don't want to break the law. We don't want to get too much ahead of our peers. We really have to think more outside the box. Everything that we have seen in the first half of 2020 is calling on us to think more creatively, to be bolder, to take more risks. And I, I, I I, you know, and I think a lot of our colleagues and our students, most importantly, our students really want us to do that and would get behind us if, if we came together to think creatively about these issues. 
Hmm. Um, I, I realize that we've got representatives from the US and the UK on this panel. So I, I'm wondering if we could shift the conversation a little bit to what you think you guys could perhaps learn from each other. What institutions in your countries could learn? Funmi, you, you mentioned that nothing like the HBCU exists in the UK and that, and why not? Why is it that, why couldn't that be an option in the UK? Are there any other things that you think UK universities could learn from US universities specifically in, in how they're fighting racism on their campuses? Um, I, I, think that, I think this is diverse. I, 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 and it's true, uh, perhaps if we had a, a university like this uh, in the UK, it begins to help us at least situate uh, how we deal with questions of, uh, of, of blackness, of, you know, uh, of people of color being able to study themselves deeply, but also white, uh, uh, you know, academics and, uh, you know, uh, across the board are studying the kind of historical issues that we've been talking about. Why not? I, I would say that, that, that that would excite me a great deal if there was a network of institutions that even wanted to explore uh, something like that. But ha having said that, the, the historical, uh, our historical context are on the one hand uh, similar, but also there's some uniqueness uh, to it. So the way in which you find the international uh, education environment in the UK today, I suspect uh, is going to rush us along to try to deal with these questions. Mm. And by the way, just to say uh, you know, a few words about the question of whiteness. There's diversity in whiteness as well, because if you look at the white academics in my institution, they come from different, 40% of them come from different parts of the world, uh, you know, have had different historical experiences. Mm. There's a ready network uh, of academics and university staff, professional services as a whole. Uh, I think we have a critical mass that would move uh, tomorrow. What is required is the institutional framework to drive that change. Mm. And this is where the question of racism persists if we do not deal with the structures that, uh, you know, that make it persist uh, in that way. And uh, that's why I think that perhaps even more than the United States, and the United States has had a long history of dealing with race issues. And at this moment, I almost think that systemically the whole country is going to move and deal with certain thematic areas. First, uh, from policing, to particular uh, political issues, thorny political issues that universities might be uh, part of. But on this side, our universities for the first time are gearing, we're gearing ourselves to respond so holistically uh, to the question of racism. Not because there are no other uh, questions of inequality, but I suspect that the baggage that we had with racism previously is going to become, these issues are so deep that it will become a very important entry point uh, for taking what I, what I think ought to invariably be an intersectional, intersectionality approach to how we deal with inequality in the university. Uh, I, as I, I think I alluded to this in my, in my paper as well, if we don't carefully manage this space and prioritize the, uh, the anti-black issues of today, but as an entry point for dealing with all the gender inequalities and other forms mm. of inequality on our campuses, we will just simply be rotating uh, and dealing with abuse and oppression in cyclical pattern. Uh, yeah. patterns, and we want to avoid that um, ultimately. So I think there's a lot to learn. What excites me most is that we can have an institution that actually devotes itself uh, to, to, to dealing with, uh, if you like, non-white or black communities and their histories, because that's been so missing uh, from, from the history of our societies here. Yet, in real terms, we have had such engagement with Black Caribbean, Black African for centuries. Mm. Mm. Thanks for that, Funmi. Wayne, I'll go to you first as, our, as our two of our US representatives. Anything that you think US universities could learn from their UK counterparts? Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot to, to learn. I, I mean, in my position as uh, president, I've traveled the world. Uh, and one of the things I always try to do is to go to universities because I want to see what they look like. So whether it's the University of Cape Town or Queen Mary um, in London, I've been in the bowels uh, of these universities, you know, wanting to understand how they work, um, you know, what's important. And we've also signed MOUs for exchanges. And I've always insisted that when we do that, 
I want exchanges not just at the student level, but at the faculty level, because that's what makes us better. Uh, we have lots of uh, faculty who want to come and spend their sabbatical here at Howard and so on. And I encourage my faculty to do the same so that we can understand uh, what happens. And I think that I think it's important um, for that course pollination to occur. Uh, th what has happened with historically black colleges and universities in the U.S. is another um, incredible story that I think has been undertold and underappreciated throughout academia, and especially when you look at black faculty in particular, uh, who've gone on to do great things and, and where uh, some of those uh, seeds have been planted. It's incredible. And even, not, even when it's not direct, uh, there has been an indirect impact. And it has um, also increased social change as well. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at that, right? Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, that basically uh, stopped the de basically desegregated our education system in America. Um, the practice, the mock presentations of that before it went to the Supreme Court occurred on Howard's campus. Mm -hmm. um, Howard lawyers were involved. So these institutions are not just here uh, for one aspect of our society. They have had a tremendous impact uh, throughout our society. And I think it's important that um, we, we get that cross pollination and we tell our story. But there's always more for us to learn and, and more for us to excel at. And the last thing I want to say, especially when it comes to higher ed institutions, our ideal should always be excellence. Whatever the transparency of the truth is and whatever that truth is, how difficult it may be and painful, our higher ed institutions, regardless of where they exist, should speak to that truth. And part of speaking to that truth is to make sure that we're clear that systemic racism occurs, exists, and that it has to be denounced. And that should happen if nowhere else it happens in the UK or in America, it must happen in our universities. Mm, yeah, I, I agree. That's a, that's a really good point. Leslie, any, any lessons the US could learn from the UK? I've been um, really interested to hear how uh, globally diverse uh, the UK universities are. And mm. um, I'm curious about how that operates um, on the ground and um, how students get along coming from all parts of the world. We do some of that in the US. Um, I think sometimes putting our uh, national interests and concerns in a global context is very important for understanding where we're going in the future. I mean, the experience we're having right now with the pandemic demonstrates our need to continue to expand our understanding of global past, present, and thinking about the future and how we're all connected. So um, I think that there may be some lessons uh, to learn, certainly uh, in a post-colonial way, uh, a decolonizing way, the ongoing decolonization effort is, is critical to understanding those global connections. But I think the US will have a lot to learn um, on that measure from our UK partners. Hmm. Yeah, which will prove itself to be even more difficult in uh, the times that we're in now, looking at international student mobility and the challenges that exist for that. Um, just a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one, one person is asking about any key practical activities or actions that they could take away from today to confront racism at their own university in the coming months. Does anybody have any ideas or suggestions, Funmi? I, I, let, let me take a stab at that. I, I, I think a starting point, as I, I, I think I alluded to earlier, is the conversations that we have. And I know it's difficult. Uh, conversations about race uh, yeah. can be very, very difficult. But that's a vitally important starting point. And being able to, to have it across uh, disciplines, between staff and students, across you know, staff bodies. Is, a, is an important starting point. But I think the symbolic things that we ask for, that we dare to ask for, such as why particular monuments are located where they're located, whether we can add histories of black people that have, in my own university, will soon be 200 years. Uh, and we have, we had an African society, we've had black uh, people uh, walk the corridors of the institutions across each generation. Uh, but when it comes to a particular generation, you, I think Wayne alluded to this earlier, you don't even see evidence that that happened in the past. Mm -hmm. That's an important starting point. But the second thing is icebreakers with students who are plenty in the diversities in our classrooms. To understand them and where they're from. This decolonizing the curriculum, we tend to be quite political about it, but actually it's about questions of power. 
mm. and to really examine the power dynamics even in our classrooms before we have uh, looked at the, uh, uh, the, the content. We argue about content, but the big shift is going to be in how we teach uh, and being sensitive to who we teach and offering them history, whether it's chemistry that we teach or pharmacy that we teach. Every discipline has a history to it and it has a lot of baggage to it and it, there's a newness to how it can be taught. And so having those conversations lightly before it sounds as though there's a, there's a law uh, on the table and every individual academic, black or white, has to be able to make a commitment as to what they'll do differently. And I want to suggest in my own way, what I hope would happen in King's College London, for example, in two years time, working with my colleague, um, Nicola Phillips in education is that we will teach cultural competency at the point of entry that every student and staff, when they come into King's for the first time, will encounter something around the ability to see the world through the eyes of the other. Mm. And that changes everything. I've seen it happen in, in small courses, in small programs, in, in the variety of ways in which uh, we do this. And so doing those bits and pieces are important, but it is then up to the leadership of that university to begin to put policies in place uh, and resource uh, the commitments that they make to begin to change things for the better. But if we don't do this from an individual level as well and work across the board, uh, it doesn't get to happen. Thanks for that. Leslie, would you like to add anything to that? I agree with everything that Pumi has said. And I'll also just add that um, we're in a moment with the pandemic, at least in my experience, that uh, a lot of things have stopped. So I'm not traveling as much. Uh, you know, there are things that we can't do right now. And so this is a, uh, an opportunity um, to uh, really uh, take up some of the things that Pumi has suggested. Take time to learn more about these issues. Um, small groups of faculty, but administrators. I can't say enough that administrators also, I know people are busy figuring out how things are gonna work for the upcoming year, but this, this, this uh, it's no coincidence to me that both the pandemic and the uprisings against police brutality are happening now because the pandemic also is so racialized. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity for us to really begin to, or continue hopefully to educate ourselves around how these issues of race are so intertwined in our institutions. And um, the, the most important thing institutions can do is to embark on a deep investigation of how this works for them and to investigate it and strategically plan around it as seriously as they would strategically plan around becoming top 10 or investigating how to find federal funds. This is just as serious and I have uh, rarely been, at, I don't think I can think of an institution that really has planned strategically around issues of diversity to the extent that they plan around other things in their uh, curricula or in their uh, planning for what makes a great university. We have to rethink what we think of when we think of great universities. And this is a perfect time to do that. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Rethinking how we think about excellence within, within our own universities. Wayne, any practical tips that people watching could walk away with? Yeah, you know, I, I'll, I'll start by um, saying that both uh, Funmi and Leslie uh, have an open invitation uh, to come on my campus and to uh, provide us with their insights about what their institutions see and do. Uh, Howard is a great place. Our DNA is social justice. There's no doubt about it. But when I took over as president, uh, of the 13 schools and colleges, we had one woman dean. And one of my legacies I hope to leave here is that we've changed that. Um, at one point, we ended up with 10 women dean. And, and when you look at our undergrad campus, uh, two thirds uh, of them are women. And so while our DNA is social justice, we also still have our challenges that we have to deal with. And I think having these two um, excellent uh, academics uh, on my campus uh, to continue to spread that is one practical way in which I, I'd like to start. I think the other thing that we have to do is to continue to make sure that the same globalization that's occurring across the world occurs in our uh, very, very siloed institutions. Um, ac academia is hard to change. I tell people it's like a flotilla. And uh, unfortunately, uh, when you change your messages, don't get to every ship. 
uh, the same way and it takes a while. And I think we have to start adapting and changing uh, what that looks like. And one way to do that is to make sure that there is cross pollination. So I, I, I encourage people to come and visit us, come and spend time with us. I encourage people to open their doors to uh, not just my students, but my faculty as well. And I think the more that we can do that and the more that we can be open about collaborating and working on problems, because none of us have, has a monopoly on great ideas um, with all the talent that we may have within our institutions. But if we do things for the global good, there's so many large problems that we can solve together. Uh, and I do believe that our higher ed institutions have demonstrated a history of being um, the change agents uh, to, to get the solution. So. I, I certainly hope that we will continue to work with one another. Thank you with that. I think that's a, a very good optimistic point to, to end on. And I'm sorry, Leslie and Funmi, if you, if you had something else to come with that, but I realize everyone has very busy schedules that they must get on with. So thank you very much, Wayne, Leslie and Funmi for joining me today. I think we could have carried this on for another two hours. There are so many things to talk about, but um, I, I hope that, this was beneficial for you and I hope everyone watching is walking away feeling a little bit more enlightened about uh, very difficult but very important conversations that we're gonna be having right now. Um, this is just one of many virtual events that THE is having. We've got another one coming up next week, June 24th, our Young Universities webinar. If you wanna find out more information about that, you can check out our events page on timeshighereducation.com. And until then, we will see you next time. Thank you very much.